will get either you will receive either two hundred dollars the probability of 50 percent so probability or you may get zero equal probability from this security r but if you purchase this security s you are gonna get 100 dollars so what's the expected cash flow from this security r expected cash flow 100 dollars right so why one half multiplied by 200 plus one half multiplied by zero so it's both securities have the expected cash flow of 100 dollars so same expected cash flows they will be generated next year so if i ask you to find the right discount rate for these two projects so if the required return the required return on this security r versus the required return on this security s so what kind of discount rate so these are the discount rates so how so if these are given so how do you find the price the right price of these two securities so i'm asking you to find the price of this security r versus the price of the security s so can you give me the equation of finding the right discount uh, finding the fair value of this security r so this security R is expected to generate $100 next year. But this is a future value, right? The price is supposed to be present value. So how do you find the price of this security R using the given information? So by definition, in any valuation in finance, the present value of a risky investment is the price of the um, a risky investment is the present value of expected future cash flows. So in this case, it's very easy. 100 is the expected future cash flows. That's future value. To convert it into present value, what do you do? You need to discount. So one plus the right discount rate for the, this risky asset to the power of one because it's $100 will be received in one year. So that's the equation. And how about the price of asset security s same the expected cash flow 100 divided by one plus r to the the discount rate for this safe security to the power of one. So that's the equation. So which security you think should be more expensive? Which security should have a higher price? So expected cash flows are both $100. So if you purchase security S, you're gonna receive 
$100. But if you purchase Security R, it can be either 200 or nothing, zero. So which one is more risky? So this is more risky. Security R is more risky. So investors will require higher apply a higher discount rate because of the risk premium. So required return will be higher. And required return, that's the discount rate. So higher discount rate means lower present value. So this is safe asset, will be more expensive than the real uh, risky, more risky asset. So that we apply this concept to capital markets. So risky stocks have on average, a portfolio of risky stocks on average earn the higher return than safer investments like US treasuries in the past. On average, for over a long time. I'm not talking about just a specific one year, just a long term average performance of riskier investments have been, uh, have had a higher uh, performance than uh, safer investments. So that's the most important lesson uh, we learned from the capital market history. So this is just uh, using this uh, simple example. I uh, explained the risk return trade-off. So there is, a, in other words, there is a, uh, the, uh, one of the most important lessons we learned from the financial market history is there is a reward for bearing risk. So in other words, investors require risk premium. So investors require higher return on risky investment. So apply higher discount rate, that means price is lower. So risky assets are sold at a lower price. So on average, returns are higher. So the greater the risk, the greater the potential reward. So investors who are willing to take more risk, they have been rewarded. So that's one of the imp most important lessons. But most interesting thing is, but that doesn't mean all the risk will be rewarded. Some risks are rewarded, others are not. So in short, the capital market history shows that taking risk unnecessarily that can be removed easily, those uh, investments have not been rewarded. So that's why you need to pay more attention and learn this concept more carefully. So, but at the end of the chapter, the concept will become more clear. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, good. And the next slide explains a very basic concept, dollar return versus percentage return. So first, let's just start with a dollar return. So total dollar return has two components. So when we invest in risk, in a risky security like stock, we have two ways to make a dollar return. So one source is from um, income generated from the security. So in case of stocks, that's dividends. And the other source of uh, generating dollar returns is uh, the change in price. So capital, that we call capital gains or loss. So in short, you should remember the two sources of total dollar return, income from investment, if it's a stock, income from uh, the stock is a dividend, and if it's a bond, income from the bond is coupons. So in addition to dividends or coupons, 
bond prices, stock prices change. So if the price is higher when you sell compared to when you purchased, you get, have capital gains. But if you are unlucky, the sale price, sale price is lower than the purchase price, you have a capital loss. So let's just start with a simple example. Suppose you purchase a bond for nine, uh, 50 one year ago, and you received two coupons, $30 each, and you sold the bond for uh, 975 today, but your total dollar return. So income, $30 twice, so 60 is the income, and capital gains is the sale price minus purchase price, so $25 is the capital gain. So total dollar return is $85. So this is how, this is how to calculate the total dollar returns. So it's not, it's, it's straightforward, right? So any questions so far? No, okay, good. But dollar returns usually are not very useful. So for example, suppose you heard that Ms. Scott earned $1 million out of um, $1 million out of the stock market last year. So is she a really good investor? The $1 million dollar return does not tell a lot of stories. So it sounds like a good performance, but what if she earned $1 million based on $100 million investment? So $1 million dollar return out of $100 million investment. That's not great only 1% return. But what about she invested $2 million, but she earned $1 million. That's impressive, right? So that's why we need to calculate percentage returns. So in many cases, percentage returns make more sense and maybe more useful in many of the analysis we are gonna do. So that's why the next step is you calculate uh, percentage returns. So that's why uh, the slide explains it. It's generally more intuitive to think in terms of percentage returns than dollar returns. So total percentage returns have two components. Just like the income part, uh, the dollar return has two components. So let's use an investment on a stock as an example. So as I mentioned, when you invest in a stock, you have two ways of uh, generating a return. One through dividends, the other through capital gains. So here is a term you need to be familiar with. The dividend yield on a stock is income, means dividends divided by the price of the stock at the beginning. So that's the definition of the dividend yield. So in other words, D1 divided by P0 is the definition of the dividend yield. And what's the capital gains yield? So capital gains yield is from the price change. So end of the period price. So sale price minus purchase price divided by purchase price. That's the capital gains yield. So total percentage return, total return on a stock is the sum of the dividend yield on the stock plus the capital gains yield on the stock. So even though we use uh, an example uh, in the stock market, this concept can be applied to any investment. So always, if I ask you to calculate the return on a risky investment, always uh, use this equation. P1 minus P0 plus D1 divided by P0. So that's the equation for total percentage return. So any questions so far?
All right, so here is a numerical example. Suppose you purchase a stock for $35. You received a dividend of $1 and a quarter, and the stock price is now $40. So what is your dollar return? So dollar return is $1.25 plus $5 capital gains. So your dollar return is $6 uh, for $5 plus $1.25. So $6.25. So that's the dollar return. So what's your percentage return first? The dividend yield is what? $1.25 divided by what? $35, not 40. So you should divide the dividend 125 by the purchase price, $35. And what's the uh, capital gains yield? So how much is the capital gains? $5 divided by what? $35 purchase price. So that's the capital gains yield and the total percentage return is the sum of these two. So here is the, the answer. So cap, dividend yield is 3.57% and capital gains yield is 14.29% and total return is 17.86%. So any questions so far? So this kind of a simple question, you should be able to calculate very quickly. So. If you don't have any questions, let's move forward. So we apply this concept to the financial market and we can get a lot of information. So for example, if I ask you, what was the average daily return on Tesla stocks during the uh, during October? Can you calculate those? Of course. So where, what should you do? You go to any websites that provide uh, stock market information for free. So yeah, for example, you go to Yahoo Finance and you can easily find Tesla stock price October 1st, October 2nd, so all the way through the end of October. And gross stocks like uh, rapidly growing stocks like uh, Tesla, rapidly growing companies don't pay dividend. So you don't have to worry about dividend yield. And so just to calculate that you apply this equation p1 minus p0 plus d1 divided by p0 but the calculation is easy when companies don't pay dividends so ignore the dividend so price change so day two minus day one uh, day one minus day, day zero price divided by day zero price so p1 minus p0 divided by p0 so you can calculate return for every day during the previous months, and you can calculate the average. Or if you want to, if I you are you are asked to calculate um, the same daily return for October and average return for October for Target stock, for example, Target definitely pays dividends, so you need to calculate the dividend and uh, use the equation P1 minus P0 plus D1 divided by P0. So you can easily calculate the return for those days and take an average. Yeah. So you apply this uh, return calculation, percentage return calculation concept to all financial markets data and you get information. And this slide um, explains the importance of financial markets. But imagine in the world, there is no market for Tesla stocks. There is no market for target stocks. It's just the stock market is not available. 
how can we find, how can investors find information about what kind of returns have been earned on risky investment? So financial markets allow companies, governments, and individuals to increase their utility. So meaning that financial markets provide a benefit to all the players, investors and companies and governments. So if there is no stock market, how can we easily invest in companies? It's very difficult. So those who have uh, extra capital, so those who don't want to um, uh, spend everything they earn, they want to save for future purchases or retirement, education, those savers, they want to find, invest in, is, they want to, savers want to find a way to easily invest in companies with, with the stock market makes it easier for investors. And also at the same time, companies have, they have good projects, positive MPV projects. They need capital, initial investment to make that uh, promising project, positive MPV project happen. They need capital. Where do they find the capital? So companies need the financial markets, stock markets, bond markets to raise capital for positive MPV projects. And in the economy, we have limited resources. So we should have a, an efficient way of allocating limited resources across more productive, better investments, and stock market provides a mechanism to allocate limited resources for profitable, positive MPV projects. So, well-functioning financial markets is very important for the welfare of the entire society. So one of the most important benefits financial markets provide is information. So if there is no stock market, how can we know what returns? How, how can investors know what returns? certain types of risky investments have earned. If there is not much information, a lot of people would stay away from that kind of OPEC marketplace, and that will not be good for anyone, investors, corporations, government. So well-functioning, maintaining a well-functioning financial market is good for everybody in the society, right? So the next slide shows what kind of returns have, uh, uh, different types of investments have earned. So to communicate this concept easily with uh, those who have not taken any finance courses, the easiest way to communicate this concept is let's start with $1 investment at some point in the past and let's take a look at how that one dollar investment grew over time so during the past year so this chart shows the performance of various types of investment for nine uh, for 90 years so starting from 1926 and, and in 2016 data, so $1 investment in 1925. So if that $1 was invested in treasury bills after 90 years, 
it grew to $13.49. But if that $1 was invested in a portfolio of small company stocks, the $1 became $33,214.15. And if it was invested in a large stock portfolio, $6,000. And long-term government bonds, $133. And uh, oh, treasury, sorry, treasury is $20.62. And e e if we just consider inflation, average inflation per e every year, it's just $1 is equivalent to $13. So this uh, historical performance chart emphasizes that kind of a risk return trade off in, impact. So this is just uh, using a, uh, a chart to, to show, illustrate the growth of $1 in different investments. And this is to you, this uh, table helps you compare using numbers in terms of return concepts you uh, learned. So we remember in earlier chapters, you learned that if you see percentage without any units, assume that that's like APL, so annual percentage, annual rate. So if nothing is written with a percent, assume that the returns are annual. So annual average return, the largest stocks based on the previous uh, chart, 12% was the return, average return per year. Small stocks, 16.6%. Long-term uh, corporate bond, 6.3%. Long-term government bond, 6%. US Treasury, 3.4%. And inflation, 3%. So you see, oh, it doesn't look like a huge difference. Large stock return 12% versus 16.6%. Doesn't look like a huge difference, but you see that. Well, how come this four percentage point difference results in such a huge difference in future value? You remember the time value of money, the difference in returns, the impact becomes huge when there is a long period so small return difference it may look small but if it's a long period the difference be, will become huge yeah but i need to emphasize you once more this is a historical return but you need to remember that expected return and historical return are different things. So, so don't use this uh, uh, when you make an investment for the future. So my point is historical returns do not show, it's not a guarantee for future returns. So in the past, small stock portfolios earned a higher return, average return during the past 90 years, that doesn't necessarily mean you are gonna earn a higher return next year from small stock investments. Future returns may be different from what happened in the past. So that, that makes finance challenging as well as interesting. So this is just an introductory uh, class. You learned history. So history gives us a very interesting um, lesson, but be careful when you make an investment decision. Um, that's why you need, uh, if you are interested in learning uh, more, more, you, you're going to learn more in, uh, in advanced uh, finance class, like investment, security analysis, portfolio management. But but this class, uh, Finance 3310, that's the first finance class we offer. Uh, just the, at least to give some introduction. But be careful applying. When you apply what you learn from 
uh, here in this intro course to real world investing, there are a lot of caveats. So, but you just started, right? So any questions, comments? All right, the next slide explains a very important, uh, uh, another very important concept, risk premium concept. So to communicate with uh, peers in this field, you need to learn the language spoken on Wall Street. So if people say risk premiums, you need to immediately think, oh, risk premiums mean the expected return on risky asset minus the risk free rate. So the risk premium means the extra return investors are supposed to be earning for risk taken. So in other words, risk premium on a risky asset means the expected return on that risky asset minus risk free rate. So the extra, so the difference is risk premium. So to calculate risk premium, we need to know the risk free rate. So what kind of investment is risk free? There is a lot of debate. There has been a lot of debate on what is the risk free rate asset in the real world. A lot of disagreement, but so far, people have agreed that US federal government securities are closest to the risk free asset. So, in your textbook, your textbook suggests using the T-bill rate, treasury bill rate, uh, as the risk-free rate. So I follow that. But there may be some variations. In some other finance courses later, you will you may see treasury note rate, 10-year treasury note rate, I use that uh, risk-free rate. Also, Bloomberg terminal uses a 10-year treasury note rate as the risk-free rate in the real world. But most finance textbooks uses um, treasury bills rate as the risk-free rate. So I follow the textbook. But later, in some other finance courses, you may uh, be asked to use treasury notes uh, rate as the risk free rate. So again, that's the difference between finance and other fields. Finance is not a pure science. We use scientific tools, statistics, but finance has its own characteristics. So finance is, has both art and science component. So there may be some differences, disagreements between analysts and investors. So you need to be flexible when you learn these kind of concepts. So it's not a clear cut. Some areas, it's a clear cut. So for example, how to calculate percentage return. So that's a clear cut. That's a science. There is a correct answer, right or wrong answer. But in some other areas, there may be some different opinions. So you need to be open to that kind of discussions. But here, in this class, of Finance 3310, I will ask you to use uh, the treasury bill rate as the risk-free rate. So treasury bills are considered to be risk-free. So I will follow the textbook, right? So the risk of premium is the return over and above the risk-free rate. So that's the definition of risk of premiums. All right. So historical risk premiums. So historically, so historically, what was the average return um, on risky investments minus the risk-free rate? So if we apply this concept to the data we saw in previous slides, so what was the uh, historical risk premiums 
So in case of large stocks, 12% minus 3.4%, so 8.6% was the historical risk premiums. So if we use historical returns as a proxy for uh, expected return. So similarly, what was the risk premiums for small stocks? So corporate bond uh, and government bond. And what's the risk premiums for treasury bills? By definition, it's zero. So why do different investments have different risk premiums? Because of, because they are, they have different amount of risk. So risk return trade-off is the most important concept you need to learn here. So you may remember, if you took a, uh, you may remember learning a histogram in a statistics class. So if you don't remember, let me remind you, histogram is a frequency chart. So during the 90 years we are using from 1926 to 2016, so this histogram is for large company stock portfolio returns. So for example, in 19, uh, in 2008, we had a financial crisis. So stock market, large cap stocks lost over 30%. So that was a huge negative return. And that kind of huge negative return happened in 1937 as well. But how about 2013? So 2013 was a very good year for large stocks. So the return was positive above 30%. And there were many years stock market performed that well. So sorting out all those 90 um, annual returns from largest to smallest and this uh how how frequently those returns happened so that's a histogram and histograms when we uh, draw a histogram for uh, different asset classes financial economists still learned that oh historical returns the histogram looks like a bellish curve. So in statistics, this kind of histogram, frequency distribution is called a normal distribution. So, so a lot of times financial economists use a, a normal distribution to explain stock returns, stock portfolio returns. So the beauty of using a normal distribution is the center mean and the width of the bell-shaped standard deviation, these are only the two. So if you know the mean and the standard deviation, you can answer any questions about normal distribution. That's the beauty. And the historical, uh, the financial market history, the frequency chart show that normal distribution is a good approximation for stock returns. So that's why we discuss how to find the variance and standard deviation of a risky investment. So to analyze stock returns. So, here. So this is a, a histogram. This, this, this figure shows histograms for the various asset classes you learned. So inflation, uh, treasuries, intermediate term government, long term government bond uh, returns, and corporate bond returns, small stock, large stock. So what do you see? So all looks roughly similar to 
the bell shape, normal distribution, and the riskiest investment, the small stock portfolio has the widest bell shape. So you remember standard deviation measures how wide is the bell curve and higher standard deviation, wider bell shape, bell curve means returns are more uncertain, can be very high, can be very low. So wide bell shape, higher standard deviation of the normal distribution means higher risk. So how to measure the risk, how to quantify risk in an investment? Financial economists found that let's use the standard deviation of the return distribution to measure risk. So that's the idea you are learning in this chapter. So that's why here we emphasize variance and standard deviation calculation. So we use variance and standard deviation to measure how uncertain, how volatile as a return. So volatility in finance measures risk. Volatility in stock returns means uncertainty. How variable, how volatile returns are. So the greater the volatility, the greater the uncertainty. So greater volatility means return can be very high, can be very low. Low volatility, low standard deviation means the variability is small. So returns are not very uncertain, but high, Wider bell shape, wider st uh, larger standard deviation means returns can be any everywhere. So, how to calculate the historical variance? So going back to the Tesla example for October re daily return. So, usually there are about 20, 21 trading days in in a month. So, for five days per week and four to five weeks per month. So 20, 21 days, trading days. So you calculate the returns, 21 trading, uh, using those 21 numbers. If I ask you to calculate the average, you add all, and divide by 21, so that's average daily return, that's the mean. If I ask you to calculate the standard deviation of the 21 returns, what are you gonna do? You first need to find for each month, for each day, day one to day 21. You subtract the day one return, you subtract the average return from the day one return, so that's deviation from the mean. And then you square, so, you square, so square the deviation from the mean for each day, day one, day two, day three, all the way to day 21. You calculate the deviation from the mean and square, and then what you do? You add all those 21 numbers divided by the number of observations, in this case, 21 minus one. So that's the definition of the variance of Tesla stock return based on historical one month, 21 day returns. So how to find the standard deviation? So standard deviation is by definition, the square root of the variance. So that's how to calculate variance and standard deviation using historical return data. And Excel has variance function and standard deviation function, and Excel's variance and standard deviation function uses exactly this formula. So that's how you use um, historical variance and standard deviation to calculate uh, historical return data to calculate the standard deviation, a measure of risk. So any questions so far? And then I have a question for you, if you don't have any questions so far. So what if you got an internship at an investment bank like Goldman Sachs, 
and your assignment is to calculate the volatility, estimate the volatility of a new project or new security, new stock. So, uh, a new new stock. So, you are in a team for an IPO, initial public offering. That means the stock you are analyzing has never been traded in the market. So that means no stock price data. So that means no data for calculating historical returns. But your task is to calculate, estimate the volatility of this new stock. What are you going to do? There is no historical price and return data available. But you need to calculate the volatility, standard deviation of this new stock. Definitely, this historical variance and standard deviation equation does not work. So in that case, you need to have a probability approach. So later, probability approach we will learn yeah here uh, in later later so before we, we go to use the probability approach so let's go through a numerical example yeah let me open another file file yeah here so i just to give you an overview preview of the link relationship between two uh, different concepts so i open i will share chapter 13 slides so here in chapter 13 you, we, we, you will go deeper and I will show another approach. So here. So going back to this IPO example, if there is no historical data available, we need to find the expected return and standard deviation based on probability of uncertain outcomes so if the economy based on it, it's you learn the scenario analysis in chapter 11 for risky projects apply the same concept to stocks so if it, it's the economy in a very good condition after uh, the vaccine development so economy fully recovers what's the probability of that kind of optimistic scenario and then what will be the return and economy is in normal condition just average base case scenario what's the probability and what's the probability of recession covid19 gets worse and then based on that kind of scenarios how to calculate the variance and standard deviation, you are going to learn that kind of scenario based approach in chapter 13. So why am I showing you this? Try to give you a big picture. Chapter 12, you use uh, historical based approach analysis and chapter, you, you add, we add more uh, advanced tools in the next chapter. But the common goal of all those chapters to find the expected return on a risky investment. So let me stop share. And then let's go back to chapter 12. So let's just step by step, go step by step. So in this uh, slide, what kind of problem is that? 
We have year one, year two, year three, year four data. So this is a historical return. Oh, then we can calculate expected return and standard deviation using the formula you learned in the previous uh, slide. So take a look at this numerical example. While on, on uh, slide number 14, while you're working on this, let me take uh, the screenshot to uh, make sure you get attendance credit. So I copied the first screen and pasted. So first screenshot taken. I move on to the second screenshot. I copied. Pasted. Okay, good. Okay, so we have a 31 student attending. All right. So if you don't have any questions, let me go back to the chapter 12 uh, slides. So we have a four uh, years historical return data. So of course, in the real world, when we do the calculation, we will definitely use more than uh, four numbers. So if it's an annual return, at least we need to use 20 years. Yeah. But this is just a simple um, classroom example, so not to make a numerical, a numerical example too complicated. I'm just using a very simple example. But if you get an idea of how to do the four year, four returns calculation, you can easily extend it to cover 20 returns. So that's the idea. So year one actual return was 15%. Year two, 9% return, 6% return. Year four, 12% return. So how do you calculate the average? So add all, that's 42% divided by four years. So 10.5% is the average return. I recommend you guys use decimal when you do this return calculation. So it's usually better less confusing and do all those calculations using decimal and then at the end convert to your answer to percentage so that's my recommendation if you really want to use percentage in the middle calculation that's okay but you should be consistent so in some places you use percentage and other play other numbers use decimal it's easy to mess up and make errors so you need to be very consistent always. So my habit is I just always use decimals and later, in, right before the uh, I submit the answer, I convert the decimal into uh, percentage. I usually do that. That's my recommendation. But if you really want to use um, percentage in the middle calculations, that's fine. But always be careful to be consistent. So deviation from the mean, you need to calculate for each observation, you subtract uh, actual return, uh, average return from the actual return, realized return for each year. So deviation from the mean, so can be positive, can be negative, and you need to square and add them all and divide it by three, not four. Because why do we subtract one from a four? It's a statistical concept because we lost one degree of freedom in calculating average. That's why we use the degree of freedom here is three, not four. So variance is scared, some of the scared the deviation from the mean divided by uh, four minus one, so that's a point zero zero one five. And then you take a square root of variance and you get standard deviation. So the standard deviation is 3.87%. So that's how to calculate 
the variance and standard deviation using historical data. So even though we just used the four year annual return problem, you can apply this um, procedure to any return for any period. Every financial assets available in the market, you can apply this concept. So this kind of concept is actually very useful for you to understand what's going on in the real world, especially in the stock market. So, and also mutual funds, ETFs. So, so I strongly recommend you to explore data available, easily available these days, internet, because of the thanks to the internet, it's very easy to find uh, information on financial markets and learn from it. So for example, there are a lot of mutual funds out there. How volatile are mutual fund returns? So Morningstar, for example, is a good website that provides information on mutual funds. So go to Morningstar website using the link and try to find information about the volatility of return to mutual funds. So definitely volatility of mutual funds investing in riskier stocks will have higher volatility. And also mutual funds specializing in safer securities like government bonds volatility will be lower. And this is the historical uh, return distribution I already explained. And I also already explained this normal distribution uh, characteristics. So the normal distribution is a symmetry, the meaning that uh, positive side and negative side uh, looks the same. So symmetry, bell-shaped frequency distribution and normal distribution, the beauty is it is completely defined by its mean and standard deviation. As long as we know the two numbers, what's the average return, what's the standard deviation of the return, then we can answer any questions about that return distribution. So that's the beauty. So here is the characteristic of a normal distribution. So one standard deviation above the mean and below the mean covers about 68% of the um, observations. So there is a 68% probability that outcomes will be within the standard, one standard deviation uh, area. So how about two standard deviation area? Two standard deviation area covers 95% of return observations. And how about three standard deviation area? So three standard deviation above and below the mean covers over 99% of stock returns. So this is a very useful information. So for example, What's the daily average return on S&P 500 index fund? Do you know what's the daily average return on S&P 500 index return? It depends on being on what year you are looking at, but for, for a long period, like uh, if you are using like 50 years of data and daily return, that's a, a lot of return data. So if you take an average of daily return for the past five years, S&P 500 index return, the average is close to zero because it's a daily return. One day, how high the return can be? So the average is very tiny, close to 0%. Because we have, all, we have about 220 trading days per day and average return on S&P 500 index return is like a, 8%, something like that, you divide it by 221, it's a tiny number. And what's the standard deviation? You apply the same uh, tool, same, same equation 
to the daily return data of S&P 500 index return, and you can calculate the variance and standard deviation. Standard deviation is close to 1%. So applied if S&P 500 index daily return is normally distributed, and what's the probability of your re observed return greater than 3%? So zero is the mean, and 1% is the standard deviation if you apply the S&P 500 index return data, and if you assume normal distribution, what's the probability of return greater than 3% per day? The percentage, the, the probability is low, below 0.5%, because the upside and downside combined probability is lower than 1% means return greater than 3% is probability is less than half percent percentage point. So it's a very rare event in terms of the probability distribution. But sometimes during like pandemic, a lot of things, weird things are happening. So you may, we may observe that kind of huge return, big return, small return more often, but it's just, if we just apply this theory to more regular average day, then that's uh, just, I'm using this example to show how is this kind of concept, standard deviation, normal distribution concept can be applied to the real world. So I'm just using this kind of a uh, real world example. So we will continue uh, on Wednesday, and remember, we are you're going to take a quiz on chapter 10 and 11 on Wednesday. So the Wednesday's class will start with the quiz. So if you don't have any questions, leave. So if you have a question, uh, stay, and you can you may write uh, a question on the chat if you have any, or you may unmute and speak. So bye everyone who doesn't have a question. So I don't see any question in the chat box. Oh, I, there may be a question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Yeah, have a good day. I don't see any questions in the chat box, and I don't hear any questions. So I end the meeting. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.